On September 8th, 2023, near the crack of dawn in New York City, the sun barely rose above the horizon, with students stumbling out of bed to fulfill their morning endeavors. The morning clouds blocked the sunlight, causing the sky to appear dark, stark gray. Additionally, the clouds looked like they were about to cry as thunder crackles overhead. Nevertheless, the city buzzes with the usual horn-pounding cacophony while people try to arrive at work as quickly as possible. A typical office building lies in the middle of the city, the glass reflecting gr the gray sky. On the fifth floor, I lay in my sleeping bag as my brain ponders different cases. Isolated and sleep-deprived, I occasionally fall asleep, which, accordingly, hinders communication with others. The office's coffee-stained carpet reeks with the smell of stale food. Additionally, the trash can is full of empty Dixie coffee cups. Work suits, socks, underwear, ties, and shoes are all stuffed in the filing cabinet, since I have no other place to keep them. There's a handheld mirror and a maroon comb on the desktop, as I always have to stay sharp and professional. Below it, there's a mini-fridge filled with monster energy drinks. Finally, parallel to the office walls lay a medium-sized sleeping bag, which I need whenever I'm too busy or tired to drive home. While lying in the sleeping bag, my phone rings loudly. The clock on the desk reads 11 in the morning, reminding me that I have to start living my daily life. Regardless, I pick up the corded phone and a man with a deep voice tainted with a New York accent speaks. Hello, is this Detective Oscar Hitman? The one and only. How can I be of service to you? We have a situation. There has been a robbery at Karen's kitchen. Okay, talk to me. I All right. Three robbers walked into the restaurant and walked out. Twelve minutes later with a bag of cash. Were they armed? Yep. Two robbers had pistols in their holsters, and one brandished theirs as they entered the store. Any casualties? There was one. Sally Patik, a host employed at the restaurant. Rising from my chair, I start packing my detective equipment. A worn down, handy dandy magnifying glass. A few plastic gloves and some evidence bags in a pocket about the size of a fanny pack. On the other side of my belt hangs my Glock. Was there anyone else harmed in the robbery? No, nobody else. Was anyone else on shift that at the time? There was one other person, Jamerson Wilson, an attendee of Townsend Harris High School. Investigate him, find out everything about him. Then I'll head over to the site of the investigation. Also, the name's Whitman. Subsequently, I dash to the stairwell. Barreling down the stairs, I finally reach the bottom floor. Despite the building having an elevator, taking the stairs seems more beneficial. The activity makes my blood flow so I can exert maximal effort on the case. Around the room sit various potted plants, one of the only forms of decoration in the lobby. The main glass entryway is right across from the elevator and the stairs. To the right of the entryway, there's the reception desk. There's a sitting area with a few couches and chairs across from the reception desk. In the lobby, there's a carpet with the logo for the New York Police Department and the abbreviation NYPD below it. Skidding to the garage, I f smell car oil and find the garage exceptionally filthy. Moreover, the last time anyone cleaned the garage was 12 years ago. A singular car waits in the back, my shaky and unsteady Nissan Altima 2005. After inserting the key and cranking the engine on, the vehicle makes the sound of a dying cat. Additionally, it takes me a few more tries to get it to turn on. The smell of car oil leaks in the garage leaks into my lungs, making me cough. After turning the car on, I head towards the exit of the underground lot and start to the restaurant. The journey to the crime scene has an ominous feel. Firstly, my derelict car is making more noise than usual, but it could be coincidental. Moreover, the people on the sidewalk seem like moving statues in a game, completely lifeless and dull, even though the streets of New York City and its people are ordinarily more interesting. After a few minutes, I arrive at the crime scene, cutting my thoughts short. Parking my car in an alleyway, the bright yellow police tape surrounding the restaurant premises clouds my eyesight. Eating from, even from a diff distance, above the entrance there is a sign of a woman in a white dress holding a pan with the words Karen Kitchen highlighted in neon below it. The glass doors are a portal to the swarming numbers of people inside. Stepping in, the sound of people conversing, running, and overall commotion covers my ears. Another set of bright yellow police tape surrounds the outlined body behind the register. The restaurant has a little waiting area at the entrance, the cash register sitting right in front of the door, leading to the seating area on the left. In the seating area, customers are being interviewed and the police carefully scour the floor to collect evidence. The body of the victim, Sally Petit, is in a body bag behind the reception desk. A random man approaches me. The man possesses a heavy New York accent, which seems highly similar to the man on the phone. Therefore, I conclude that this man seems to be the one on the phone. Conversely, the man appears burly, with his police uniform bursting at the seams. Additionally, he is chubby with a shaved beard and a worn-down cap. Furthermore, he has pitch-black eyes and thick black eyebrows. 
with his nose appearing crooked and misshapen. The conversation starts with, have you found anything about the process of the robbery? Yes, witnesses report that there were three of them. Moreover, they each came in with different masks, jeans, and jackets. The robbers then proceeded to threaten for the money by pointing the gun at Sally Pitit. The girl fumbled with the money, apparently nervous, and the robber shot her four times in the chest, matching the money she had already put in the bag. Okay, thanks for the info. Starting the investigation, I find the open cash register and the jet black body bag. Sadly, other than those, there is nothing to be found in the restaurant. As I examine the environment closely, I see a business card pushed under a wooden panel on the floor. The, the card shows signs of being stepped on. It has dust around the edges and little specks of mud and dirt everywhere along the sides and center of the card. In the very center of the card, there's a phone number engraved. The words event organizers shine brightly in pink a few centimeters above. Moreover, the card, outlined with golden trims, features ribbons that look like they're dancing all over the card. <coughs> the business card has an intriguing purpose with only a phone number. 212-213-3403. In a title, the words event organizers are way too vague. What events? Why such a generic name? Who would be on the other end of the line? Reserving myself from all the questions, I slowly move on to the rest of the restaurant. Unable to find anything interesting, I move out of the robbed restaurant with the business card that could help me solve this mysterious, ominous case. Calling Gabriel Brown, my dear friend, he eventually picks up on the fourth ring. Subsequently, I inquire if he wants to help me solve this mystery. Hey, want to help me solve this mystery? I implore. I'm busy. With what? I'm sorry, but I'm not allowed to disclose that information. Before I could probe further, he cuts the call and puts his phone on silent. So finally, I decide to return to my dull office and find potential suspects who could have committed this heinous yet mysterious crime. While getting in my car, someone ambushes me from behind. A sharp, freezing metallic object grazes my throat, ensuring I do not move an inch. With a combat knife placed straight across my throat and a gun to my temple, they utter, If you value your life, stay away from this scene and this case forever. The mysterious figure pokes my neck with his knife, leaving a precise drop of blood on my throat before stalking away. Until the footsteps fade away, I do not dare to look back. Once I stabilize, I rush back to the office as quickly as possible, ready to decipher the case. However, when I arrive, I find my cubicle raided, all of my belongings in the office, and even my comb ended up taken by whoever stole from me. Nonetheless, there was the exception of the business card in my pocket. Therefore, the only option is to improvise and use the business card to find as many clues as possible with just the number on the card and the title on the card. At the office, I try my hand at deciphering this case with the limited clues available. The business card, the robbery, and the office must hint that something big was going to happen quite soon. But who and what were they planning? After countless hours, I finally identify a suspect, Karen Ad Adlinsberg the restaurant manager who's, whom the mask intruders had robbed. Since Karen was off shift, she would have known all the locations of all the items in the store, which couldn't have been a coincidence. To add to that, she also seemed very neutral about the situation, with an employee murdered and her restaurant robbed. On another note, it seems that all this thinking has taken many hours to figure out, and going home this late at night would be undesirable, so guess my cubicle will be like my bedroom for the night. The following day, I pack up all my equipment and out the door I go. While on my way to the restaurants, jamming to music on the radio, I see a short teenage boy sitting on the street. Pulling up to the side of the road, I lowered my window and asked, Hey, kid, what's your name? Uh, Jamerson? Where are your parents? They're out now. They, uh, had some errands to do. You should not be out here. Even at this time of day, people can get hurt. I know, but I can handle it myself. After a long conversation, I learned much about Jamerson. Unsurprisingly, Jamerson is a 17-year-old boy who dreams of being a detective and has many attributes common to mind. Jamerson, brilliant and talented, definitely knows his stuff. Unfortunately, because of his intelligent and shy behavior, Jamerson's never really had friends. Consequently, Jamerson was lying about waiting for his parents. In reality, Jamerson was trying to get money to help his hardworking but low-income family. After informing him I was a detective, he leaped up and asked if he could help. As first, I thought, what can this boy do for me? But would it hurt to let a kid like him try solving a case? But then, I also realized something crucial to the topic. Wait, are you Jamerson Wilson, the one that works at Karen's Kitchen? Yes, sir. Picking him up inside my Nissan Ultima, we head to the restaurant. Because Jamerson knows the store quite reasonably, that could help me uncover more clues that expose Karen. 
Walking over to Karen, seeming nonchalant, I see her working at the front desk in the restaurant. Why, hello, Oscar. Hey, Karen. A fine morning to you. If you don't mind me asking, has anything suspicious happened since the robbery? Nothing much. Everything's going smoothly. Except there have been no customers in the last few days. Can I ask you some questions? Sure, whatever you need. After being sat at a table in the empty restaurant, I question her. Firstly, I looked through her background and discovered that Karen Ad Adlinsberg is the owner of the favorite restaurant, Karen's Kitchen. Her very chunky shape and fancy clothes don't look very appealing. Moreover, Karen's face always looks baggy and scrunched as she is always angry at her workers. She always wobbles the way she walks and tries to compliment the customers, but in reality, she's a stingy person whom no one likes, influencing her works workers to avoid her. In comparison, her speech is exceptionally smooth because she practices talking at home very loudly. She also sings in her own time to calm herself down from all the stress in the restaurant. Additionally, she also thinks the best she also thinks about the best insults to jab at her workers. So, where were you when the incident occurred? I was off shift, at home, sleeping. Okay, but what were you doing? What do you mean? She then proceeds to look at me with that disgusting glare of hers. Okay, okay, I was outside with a friend. I don't ask, we were just shopping. Well, that is not surprising. Karen sneers back at me. Plus, the fact that you dared lie to a government official is outrageously bold. Well, I mean, how do I know that you were a government official? Taking out my badge, I slam it on the table. After contemplating the government badge, she reluctantly agrees to answer the questions truthfully. So, where exactly did you shop? There's no point in lying because I have all the camera footage from the entire mall. Westfield World Trade Center. As I exit the room to check the footage, Karen jumps up and starts towards the door. Nevertheless, before leaving, I scream, HEY! DON'T MOVE! I unholster my Glock. Mortified by the sight of my gun and terrified that she may have made the worst decision, she stops moving immediately. Back in the seat, now. Wait, Oscar. I have some information that may be useful. Okay, tell me. After a small investigation, I get some clues. The culprit was wearing a plaid shirt and cargo pants, hiding any devices he needed. Thank you for the information. We both said our goodbyes, and my deductive reasoning skills led me to believe that Karen was a distraction from the actual culprit all along. Jamerson and I leave the restaurant to try and discover any fresh suspect that seemed overlooked. I suddenly realized the one piece of evidence I always had but never used, the business card. When typing in the number 212-213-3403 from the business card into Google, I discover a Facebook group named The Event Organizers. The group's description tells that they organize memorials for significant events, with the only thing on their calendar being the September 11th memorial. Hold on, when I called Gabriel two hours before I left the restaurant, he said he was busy. Two hours later, I find myself jumped by a muscular figure quite similar to Gabriel. Also, he mentioned hosting a memorial for September 11th in our free time to commemorate thousands upon thousands of Americans dying in the crash. Conveniently, the number found on the business card had the handle the event organizers. This can't be a coincidence. So the evidence now points to the 9-11 memorial holder, Gabriel Brown, the one person calling friend was possible. I instantly knew to confront Gabriel before he can achieve his malicious intentions. Once I arrive at Gabriel's house, to my surprise, no one answers the door. Once I notice the lights in the house aren't on, I realize that I'll have to solve this problem the hard way. Getting creative, I decide to enter through the windows. The second my feet touch the ground, the floor creaks. Moreover, the air feels abnormally chilly inside a house. At this time though, finding Gabriel became the current goal. Well, it wasn't tough to find him because he works in the master bedroom with a straight view of his entire setup through the fo foyer doors. But surprisingly, he sat at his desk, unaware of my entry. What kind of psychopath wakes up at 5am for plain and simple work? I almost say out loud. Obviously, after finding Gabriel, I confront him. Follow me. Heck no, I ain't no- With a burst of strength only that hulking figure could muster, Gabriel drags me by my ruffled collar, keeping me at the perfect distance to where none of my counter attacks reach him. He looks like he went from an excited and goofy person to a malicious and menacing man, and he stares deep into my soul. After what seems like an eternity, one of my right hooks land, and Gabriel turns around and glares back at me. That glare, those slate gray eyes, bore into my soul. Then, Gabriel speaks. 
So, it seems that you have found me out. Well, I'm afraid you cannot bask in the glory, my friend. I can hear the malicious intent behind his voice. What do you mean? Once I hear pounding from the corridor outside the room, I immediately snap to attention. Seeing no escape through the door, I take advantage of my surroundings and take something from the desk in the middle of the room. Then I jump out of the window and run in the cold, dead night. Eventually, seeing that the guards have lost me, I take two objects from my pants pocket. A piece of paper outlining the motive of Gabriel's unknown scheme, and a recorder in which I recorded Gabriel confessing. These objects will prov provide significant progress towards the event investigation. I recite straight from the piece of paper. After a long time, the US will realize that their perfect security is not as perfect as they think it is. Under the memorial lay 15 sticks of dynamite strategically placed around the perimeter of the memorial for maximum efficiency. <clears throat> Why would he want to blow up the memorial? I ask myself. But then everything clicks. The memorial event, the event organizers, Gabriel and the bombs. Running to the nearest corded phone, I call the police. However, my communication skills only get me as far as talking to the operator, and he cuts me off as soon as he hears the date. The operator laughs into the phone, exclaiming, All right, buddy, how about you come down to the station and explain the situation to us tomorrow? I must wait, but with the current situation, waiting is not an option, so I decided to take the problem into my own hands. Despite this, getting a good night's rest is the best option. So as a result, I decide to head back to the apartment for the needed rest. On the day of the event, 22 years after that tragic accident, I arrive at the memorial. As the bystanders gather around the monument, I spot Gabriel exiting to a back room under the makeshift stage. Consequently, as the door closed, I tiptoe behind him. Then, with my hand in my holster, I follow him until he stops in a room with many monitors and shiny, inconspicuous buttons. Subsequently, I walk up as Gabriel sits on a shiny throne, placing my revolver as a tent pull. Disarm the dynamite! What? Oscar, what are you doing here? Disarm the bombs if you fuck your life. Pretty ironic, huh? Then a sudden sense of deja vu runs through my spine like a spider crawling over it. Alright, alright. I'll disarm them. Just please let me live. After Gabriel types in a few commands to his console, a plethora of servos activate. I command, walk out slowly with your hands up. As we walk back up the stairs, Gabriel opens the door, slips through, and locks it within a second. Brown, you son of a- I shout, annoyed. I shoot out the door hinges, careful not to let stray shrapnel come my way. Trying my best to find him, I contact my assistants to find anything on Gabriel Brown's movement, but they all come out empty. As I stand there, trying to reach my co-workers, the crowd begins to whisper anxiously. Immediately, I realize what I must do. So I walk up to the stage, conducting a moment of silence. I then cobble together a speech, wishing them along the way after. Two days later, I lay in bed, thinking about my mother. When I spoke that speech, I was taking words directly from my heart so that the world could see my story. There has to be some disrespectful moron recording it on their phone and posting it to social media. What am I doing with my life, I wonder. Not getting out of bed for a day and a half has caused me to reek of body odor. Conversely, I spring out of bed, immediately regretting it. My back and hips and piercing pain throughout my nervous system. However, I feel better knowing that I saved hundreds of lives from the icy grasp of death disallowing them to succumb to dynamite ripping apart their bodies. Feeling satisfied about myself, I try to forget what happened days before. Notwithstanding, I have closure.